Good evening. Tonight we're going to talk about the central dogma of molecular theory. Now, dogma is usually defined as being beliefs that are held without evidence, just that are assumed to be true. But in the case of uh, the central dogma of molecular biology, that is not the case, because there is a tremendous amount of evidence supporting the uh, dogma that we're going to cover. So the central dogma of, my, of molecular biology concerns the flow of genetic information going from DNA to RNA to proteins. That's three different uh, steps. The first one is DNA replication, where the DNA produces an exact copy of itself. The second part is transcription, where the DNA is used to make RNA. And then the last part is called translation, where the RNA transfers that genetic information into the production of proteins. Here we have uh, the diagram for replication or reproduction of DNA. And as you can see, uh, there are a number of steps involved and a number of different uh, chemicals, uh, proteins involved in, in the work of doing that, making an exact copy of the DNA, where the same strands are separated and then duplicated. In transcription, as we said, the uh, information in the DNA is turned into strands of RNA. And that occurs in, a, uh, which in the nucleus using a, uh, an enzyme called RNA polymerase. Why does it happen that way? Because the DNA is in the nucleus. The proteins need to be out in the cell. The DNA is too big to exit from the uh, nucleus through the nuclear pores. So the uh, ribosomes that are used in translation are not found in the nucleus. They're in the cytoplasm to make the proteins. The instructions, that information that the DNA carries for making proteins has to get to the ribosomes. So it has a type of RNA called messenger RNA or mRNA that carries those instructions to the ribosomes. Now, in a previous lecture, we talked about the base pairing rules for uh, replicating DNA. Adenine is always bound to thymine or A to T. Guanine always binds to cytosine or G to C. For RNA, it is, has one change in it that's very important. There is no thymine in RNA. It's uracil. So the adenine binds to uracil, which is A to U, just in RNA. The guanine still binds to cytosine, so it's G to C. Here we see a comparison of DNA and RNA. The uh, DNA stands for deoxyribose nucleic acid. So the sugar for DNA is deoxyribose. But for RNA, it's ribose. It just means that the ribose has one more oxygen than the deoxyribose. The bases, as we just went over, DNA is ACGT whereas RNA is ACGU. Thymine is replaced by uracil. The basic structure, as Washington Crick found out with help of Franklin, 
DNA is a double-stranded helix, whereas RNA is a single-stranded helix, making it smaller and able to exit the nucleus through the nuclear pores. Here we see uh, the transcription to produce RNA uh, in the uh, first diagram there. Uh, there one doesn't show up well on a white screen. Um, the, uh, as you can see, the, uh, once the RNA is produced, it exits through the uh, nuclear pores so that the protein can be made in the next step using the ribosomes. This is a uh, diagram made of the uh, three-dimensional structure of RNA polymerase, which is the important enzyme for transcription. It uh, allows the uh, DNA to be copied, the information changed to a strand of RNA. RNA polymerase is the enzyme, the very important one. Now, there's a mushroom called a monotos. There's a monotos beloides, nicknamed the death cap, and a monotos veroso, destroying or death angel, for its nickname, and a monotos vernae, the fool's mushroom. Those three are extremely toxic. As a matter of fact, when I was teaching regularly, talk to my students about if they were stranded on a desert island uh, or somewhere, how would they know what to eat? And they'd come up with a number of guesses, and one of them would, somebody would invariably say, well, watch what the animals eat. Well, that's a fairly good idea, but there's a problem with that because these three mushrooms are eaten by rabbits. But if you eat one of those, it'll cause death fairly quickly. They're highly toxic. 90% of the deaths that occur from eating mushrooms are eating from this group. And the reason the toxic is so effective is it stops DNA polymerase, I'm sorry, RNA polymerase from working. It destroys that and you die, quite simply. Stages of transcription. So we talked before about the, the three types of uh, methods of getting the information from DNA to protein. Within the transcription, there are three different stages for that. There's initiation to get it started, elongation, and then termination to make it stop. In initiation, the RNA polymerase attaches to the DNA at a promoter sequence. It has to recognize that. The RNA polymerase unwinds the DNA, separating the strands, exposing the bases within them. The non-coding strand of DNA is used as a template to make the RNA. So the RNA will end up being identical to the coding strand of DNA. Because remember, the coding strand is the opposite of the non-coding strand. So the RNA is identical to that, except for the fact that, of course, thymine is replaced with uracil. In the process of elongation, the uh, code transfer continues on down the line. As the RNA polymerase moves along the DNA strand, the bases are added to the RNA strand, matching again A to U and C to G. And here we have an electron micrograph showing that process uh, going on. It happens in several different places on that DNA strand. It's all going on simultaneously, where the strands get separated and the uh, process begins and continues. So it involves several RNA polymerases at the same time. 
The third step is termination. During termination, a polyadenylation signal on the DNA causes another enzyme to cut off that growing RNA strand once it's reached the end that it needs to be. The RNA polymerase continues strands transcribing a region which creates a useless strand of RNA. We don't know why, but it does. In eukaryotes, the messenger RNA strand then undergoes modifications before leaving the nucleus. Has to have some changes made. And here we see the three stages uh, for transcription. Initiation, where it gets started, when it recognizes where it needs to be. Elongation, as it's continued. And then termination, when another enzyme cuts it off. These modifications that occur after it's been cut off um, happen inside the nucleus before the RNA can leave. This occurs in uh, eukaryotes, organisms that have a true nucleus. That RNA strand may be further modified by capping, polyadenylation, and splicing. It's different for prokaryotes, but we're not going to go into that for now. Capping is the addition of a three prime nucleic acid on the end to avoid damage by any uh, endonuclease that recognizes five prime ends. So it just adds on a three prime nucleic acid at the end to disguise it. Polyadenylation is the addition of a long poly A tail to the three prime end to make it easier for the RNA to leave the nucleus to make the RNA more stable also, and for later use in translation. That poly A tail becomes very important. Splicing, the third process, is the removal of the introns and the joining together of the extrons, uh, exons. That process is catalyzed by a spliceosome, which is a complex of small nuclear ribonucleoproteins, or SNRPs, as we like to call them. Transcribing the non-coding RNA, the RNA that's not going to be used that. The transcribed gene may encode for non-coding RNA, such as microRNA, ribosomal RNA, which is abbreviated rRNA, transfer RNA, which is abbreviated tRNA, and the enzymatic RNA molecules called ribozymes. Their discovery led to the RNA world hypothesis for the origin of life, that possibly all life started with RNA and not DNA. Um, there used to be another kind of RNA called immune RNA or iRNA. And I did research on that for my uh, graduate thesis and uh, found out it doesn't even exist. We wasted a lot of time on that, and there were a lot of publications. And uh, I kind of uh, was one of the people who proved it's not real, which also kept me from getting my master's degree. Translation. The third process in getting this genetic information, the code, from DNA into the proteins that do all the work. Translation is the process of producing those proteins. That process involves ribosomes, uh, which read the code on the messenger RNA and then add appropriate amino acids to the protein as it's being created. So here we have a diagram showing ribosomes. There are some ribosomes that are free and some that are attached to the endoplasmic reticulum, which is kind of like a subway system throughout the cell. Ribosomes are very small particles. They assemble those amino acids into the polypeptides that will make up the proteins. Um, 
The ones in the endoplasmic reticulum are what we call membrane bound because they're actually attached, not free floating like the other uh, ribosomes. The ribosomes come in two subunits. The two subunits are made of ribosomal RNA and proteins. Eukaryotes, ones with cells with true nucleus, have 40S and 60S ribosomal units. S stands for Spedberg units. That's uh, the measurement of sedimentation, of how fast it moves through a liquid uh, in uh, sedimenting out. Um, the 40 and 60S are not additive. <coughs> when you combine them, you don't get a 100S ribosome. Uh, 40 and 60S gives an 80S ribosome. And there you have uh, a diagram showing the uh, small subunit, uh, the 40S, and beneath that, the 60S. And then those two come together to make the complete ribosome at 80S. When the two subunits are joined together to make a ribosome, the messenger RNA is placed at the interface of those two. And that's where the polypeptide is made. It forms at the interface there between them. Depending on the source of information or the person who's teaching it, the process of translation occurs in anywhere from three to seven steps. I'm going to use the one I like, which is the three terms that I use for transcription. Initiation, elongation, and termination. And on the right there, you have a diagram that indicates how this process occurs. So, the purpose of this is to form polypeptides by putting together amino acids. All the amino acids have the same basic structure. We have an amino group, which is um, the H3N ion. We have a central carbon with a hydrogen on it. Also on that central carbon is a carboxyl group meaning the acid part. So we have the amino group and the acid group to make a uh, amino acid. And then each amino acid has an R attached to the carbon. Well, that R stands for side chains. It's just different side chains that can be on there to give different amino acids. And these are the structures of the amino acids uh, that are commonly seen. There are some variations. Uh, the part that is highlighted in blue is the R group. And that changes the properties of that amino acid very significantly. In the upper left-hand corner, you can see the simplest one, where the R group is just an H. Uh, and that's the amino acid glycine. And then in the lower right-hand corner, you see some of the uh, ones that have ring compounds on them, such as tryptophan, which has two different ring compounds for the R group. Initiation is that process of the two ribosomal subunits coming together and then the messenger RNA strand being at the interface between the two units. <coughs> Excuse me. Then the first transfer RNA Transfer RNA is another kind of RNA we mentioned before. And uh, it attaches to the start codon, reading the triplet code, the three uh, bases that form it. And I like this diagram. There, it, it used to be in the form of a table, but the circle makes it so much easier, in my opinion. So in the middle, you have G, U, A, and C. So you look at your triplet code. Let's say you have a triplet code of G, C, A. Well, what will that translate to for an amino acid? 
you start with the G, and that means look in the uh, center of the uh, ring right there. You see the G, and then you go out to the next letter, which I said would be, in this case for our example, C. So you go G to that yellow C, and then out to A. And you see that that codes for alanine. You also notice there that that third one has uh, four different possibilities, and you still get alanine. There's some redundancy, and that's very important. Oh, try that again. So the triplet code is redundant. Now that means some of the amino acids are specified by more than one code. <clears throat> no, uh, and I just went over the example with GCA. Well, GCU, GCC, and GCG all code for alanine. That's very important. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, let's go back. So why is that important? Well, if a mutation occurs in that third uh, codon, it's not going to affect what protein is made for some of these. Now, some of them, um, if you went to um, C, then A, the pink one there, and then the next one, with one you get uh, histamine, and another, uh, I believe that's, uh, well, I'm not sure. Anyway, it gives you two different amino acids depending on that third codon. So sometimes it is very important, but sometimes it helps to protect you against mutations that might occur. And this is the old uh, tables that were used that uh, shows that for each amino acid, uh, the letter codes that uh, are, oh, I'm sorry, that this is the abbreviated letter codes for the names. So the uh, arginine is A-R-G. And then there's also one letter codes that can be used for those amino acids. So the arginine becomes just R. Transfer RNA is a uh, four-sided molecule in its fourth dimension, uh, sorry, in its third dimension. Uh, on the right-hand side, you have a diagram uh, showing the way it would look as a stick figure. On the left, it shows the other parts. And so you have different arms of the molecule. And there's can be, be anywhere from 74 to 93 different nucleotides to make that. Now, the uh, anticodon at the bottom, the bottom arm, has to match up to the, uh, the uh, amino acids. During elongation, the next triplet code on the messenger RNA dictates which amino acid is added next as the ribosome moves along that strand of RNA. Six to nine amino acids are added per second. So it's a fairly fast process. It's ongoing. Different enzymes will catalyze these reactions. So you, there's a number of them. That process does require a great amount of energy. For example, let's translate the following strand. <coughs> so we have GAC, AUG, GGG, UAC, notice I'm reading them in triplets because it's the triplet code that matters. UUU, CAC, UAG. The first one there is GAC. So if we look on the table and go G in the blue in the center, in the next ring, the pink A, and then in the next ring, we have a C. And that's the yellow C there. And it says that's aspartame. And so 
when we translate that, the next one would be aspartame. And then we also had the, uh, uh, not only the ASP, but the single letter code. And for aspartame, it's D, the letter D. And then you simply continue on down the line. You get the last one, UAG. We go to the center. U is green there. Then you go up one to uh, the pink A, and then out from there to the uh, G. And there's nothing there, a black square. Well, if you look down at the code at the bottom, a uh, arrow type black shape, that triangle, means to start. But a black square means stop. So at that point, it would stop translating and making that polypeptide. And that's where it would cut off. So in this case, I should look at something wrong because GAC is not giving us methionine. Normally, when you get methionine, that is a start code. So I made some uh, typo there. And then single letters becomes MGYFH, much shorter abbreviation to use to indicate that polypeptide. So that last step then is termination. At termination, the ribosome encounters one of those three stop codons from the wheel and an enzyme cuts the polypeptide free from the ribosome. The messenger RNA, the tRNAs, they all get used over and over, making more and more copies. Next thing we want to look at is protein structure. Very important for the functioning of the proteins. Proteins uh, have four different levels of structure. <clears throat> and they are simply called primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary. And on the right, we have a, a diagram for a molecule of hemoglobin. And in the fourth uh, structure, the quaternary, that involves giving the hemoglobin its basic function. Because in the middle is going to be a, model, a uh, atom of iron. And that iron will bind to oxygen and then carry that oxygen throughout the bloodstream. The sequence of the amino acids gives what we call the primary structure of the protein. The interactions of the amino acids with each other the uh, chemical properties of them, determines that secondary structure. And the two basic secondary structures are alpha helixes and beta pleated sheets. And there's two examples in the diagram. The lower one on the left gives the result of a beta pleated, beta -pleated sheet. The uh, spiral one on the right is the uh, alpha helix. And that's due to the hydrogen bonding of the carbonyl oxygen in the acid part of amino acid, of one of the amino acids, to the amino hydrogen of another amino acid. The tertiary structure of a protein is the overall three-dimensional structure of it. It's due to bonding between those R groups that we have on the amino acids. Uh, there can be hydrogen bonding. There's ionic bonding. There's dipole-dipole interactions. There's London dispersion forces. There's hydrophobicity. And there's disulfide bonds. All of those contribute to that three-dimensional structure to make the shape of the polypeptide. Some proteins have a quaternary structure. 
that's when you take two or more polypeptide chains and put them together. In the case of the hemoglobin, we had four different polypeptide chains to get put together, as shown in the diagram. Uh, there are two alpha chains and two beta chains attached to the heme molecule that ends up having the oxygen carrying it. And then lastly, uh, well, I want to show you a uh, short uh, video that sums all of this up. It's tightened down here to the keratin in my hair. But most of the polypeptides that get made aren't structural proteins like hair, they're enzymes which go on to act like the assembly machinery, breaking down and building and combining carbohydrates and lipids and proteins that make up variations of cell material. So enzymes are just like whatever ingenious machinery they use the factory to make this. Okay, let's start out in the layer. I mean, the nucleus. The length of DNA that we're going to be transcribing onto an RNA molecule is called our transcription unit. And let's say, in today's example, that it's going to include the gene that transcribes for our friend Titan, which in humans, at least, occurs on chromosome 2. Now, each transcription unit has a sequence just above it on the strand, and that's called upstream. Biologists call that upstream on the strand, and that sequence sort of defines when the transcription unit is going to begin. This special sequence is the promoter, and it almost always contains a sequence of two of the four nitrogenous bases that we talked about in our last episode. Adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine. Specifically, the promoter is a really simple repetition. We got thymine, adenine, thymine, adenine, and then A, 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 and then on the other side, A, T. Because you know how this works, right? This is called the Tata box. It's nearly universal, and it helps our enzyme figure out where to bind to the strand. Now you'll remember from our episode about DNA structure that DNA strands run in one of two directions, depending on which end of the strand is free and which end has a phosphate bond. One direction is 5' prime to 3', prime, and the other direction is 3' prime to 5'. Prime. In this case, upstream means toward the 3' prime end, and downstream means toward the 5' prime end. So the first enzyme in this process is RNA polymerase, and it copies the DNA DNA sequence downstream of the ta-ta box, that's towards the 5' prime end, and copies it into a similar type of language, messenger RNA. Quick aside, so you'll notice that to read the DNA in order to make enzymes, we need an enzyme in the first place, so it kind of gets chicken-egg here. We need the enzyme to make the DNA and the DNA to make, make the enzyme. So where did RNA polymerase come from in the first place if we haven't made it yet? What an excellent question. It turns out that all of these basic necessities get handed down from your mom. She packed quite a lot more into her egg than just her DNA, so, you know, we had a healthy start. So, thanks, Mom. So the RNA polymerase binds to the DNA at that Tata -ta box and begins to unzip the double helix. Working along the DNA chain, the enzyme reads the nitrogenous bases, those are the letters, and helps the RNA version of those nitrogenous bases floating around in the nucleus to find their match. Now, you might also recall from our previous episodes that nitrogenous bases only have one counterpart that they can bond with. But RNA, which is the pink one here, doesn't have thymine like DNA. DNA does, which is the green and the blue. Instead, it has uracil. So U appears here in T's place as a partner to adenine. As it moves, the RNA polymerase rezips the DNA behind it and lets our new strand of messenger RNA peel away. Eventually, the RNA polymerase reaches another sequence downstream called a termination signal that triggers it to pull off. Now, some finishing touches before this info can safely leave the lair. First, a special type of guanine is added to the 5' prime end. That's the first part of the mRNA that we copied, and that's called the 5' prime cap. On the other end, it looks like I fell asleep with my finger on the A key of my keyboard, but another enzyme added about 250 adenines onto the 3' prime end. This is called our poly-A tail. These caps on either end of the mRNA package make it easier for the mRNA to leave the nucleus. They also help protect it from degradations from nearby passing enzymes, while also making it easier to connect with other organelles later on. But that's still not the end of it, as if to try to confuse me to protect the secret hot pocket recipe, the original recipe book also contains lots of extra misleading information. So just before leaving the nucleus, that extra information gets cut out of the RNA in a process called RNA splicing. And it's something like editing this video. This process is really complicated, but I just had to tell you about two of the key players because they have such cool names. One, the SNRPs, 
which are small nuclear ribonucleoproteins. These are a combination of RNA and proteins, and they recognize the sequences that signal the start and end of the areas to be spliced. SNRPs bunch together with a bunch of other proteins to form the spliceosome, which is what does the actual editing, as it were, breaking the junk segments down so their nitrogenous bases can be reused in DNA or RNA, and sticking together the two ends of the good stuff. That good stuff that gets spliced together, by the way, are called the exons because they will eventually be expressed. The junk that gets cut out are just the intervening segments, or the introns. The material in the introns will stay in the nucleus and get recycled, so for instance, Titan down there is thought to have hundreds of exons when it's all said and done, probably more than 360, which may be more than any other protein. And it also contains the longest intron in humans, some 17,000 base pairs long. Man, Titan, it is just a world record holder. So now that it's been protected and refined, the messenger RNA can now move out of the nucleus. Okay, so a quick review of our Hot Pocket Mission Impossible caper so far. We broke into the lair containing the instructions, we copied down those instructions in shorthand, we added some protective coatings, and then we cut out some extra notes that we didn't need, and then we escaped back out of the lair. Now I have to actually read the notes, make the machinery, and assemble the ingredients. This process is called translation. So next, Rewind your memory or just watch that video again to the episode about animal cells. Do you remember the rough endoplasmic reticulum? I hope you do. Those little dots on the membranes are the ribosomes. And the processed messenger RNA gets fed into a ribosome like a dollar bill into a vending machine. Ribosomes are a mixture of protein and a second kind of RNA called ribosomal RNA, or rRNA. And they act together as a sort of workspace. rRNA doesn't contribute any genetic information to the process. Instead, it has binding sites that allow the incoming mRNA to interact with another special type of RNA, the third in this caper called transfer RNA, or tRNA. And tRNA really might as well be called translation RNA because that's what it does. It translates from the language of nucleotides into the language of amino acids and proteins. On one end of the tRNA is an amino acid. On the other end is a specific sequence of three nitrogenous bases. These two ends are kind of matched to each other. Each of the 20 amino acids that we have in our body has its own sequence at the end. So if the tRNA has the amino acid methionine on one end, for instance, it can have UAC as the nucleotide sequence on the other end. Now it's just like building a puzzle. The mRNA slides through the ribosome. The ribosome reads the mRNA three letters at a time, each set called a triplet codon. The ribosome then finds the matching piece of the puzzle, a tRNA with three bases that will pair with the codon sequence. That end of the tRNA, by the way, is called the anticodon. Sorry for all the terminology. You need to know it! And of course, by bringing in the matching tRNA, the ribosome is also bringing in whatever amino acid is on that tRNA. Okay, so starting at the five prime end of the mRNA that's fed into the ribosome, after the five prime cap, for almost every gene, you find the nucleotide sequence AUG on the mRNA. The ribosome finds a tRNA with the anticodon UAC, and on the other end of that tRNA is methionine. The mRNA, like a mile-long dollar bill, keeps sliding into the ribosome so that the next codon can be read, and another tRNA molecule with the right anticodon binds on. If the codon is UUA, then the matching tRNA has an AAU on one end and a leucine on the other. And if the mRNA has an AGA, then the matching tRNA has a UCU on one end and an arginine on the other. In each case, that new amino acid gets connected onto the previous amino acid, starting a polypeptide chain, which is the beginning, the very beginning of a protein. But it turns out that there are lots of different ways to read this code, because UUA is not the only triplet that codes for leucine. UUG does too, and arginine is coded for by six different triplets. This is actually a good thing. It means we can make a few errors in copying and transcribing and translating DNA, and we won't necessarily change the end product. The process continues, with the mRNA sliding in a bit more, and the ribosome bringing in another tRNA with another amino acid, and that amino acid binding to the existing chain, and on and on and on and on and on. Sometimes for thousands of amino acids to make a single polypeptide chain, for example. This whole word is basically just the names of the amino acids in the sequence, and the order in which they occur in the protein, all 34,350 of them. But before we can make our own hot pockets, and that string of amino acids becomes my muscle tissue, we have some folding to do. That's because proteins, in addition to being hella big, can also contort into very complex and downright lovely formations. One key to understanding how a protein works is to understand how it folds. And scientists have been working for decades on computer programs to try and figure out protein folding. Now, the actual sequence of amino acids in a polypeptide, what you see scrolling along down there, is called its primary structure. 
one amino acid covalently bonded to another, and that one to another, and to another in a single file. But some amino acids don't like to just hold hands with two others. They're a bit more promiscuous than that. The hydrogens on the main backbone of the amino acids like to sometimes form bonds on the side, hydrogen bonds, to the oxygens on amino acids a few doors down. When they do that, depending on the primary structure, they bend and fold and twist into a chain of spirals called a helix. We sometimes also find several kink strands laying parallel to one another called pleated sheets. All those hydrogen bonds and pleated sheets are what makes silk strong, for instance. So in the end, our promiscuous amino acids lead to wrinkled sheets. Uh-huh. These hydrogen bonds are what help give these polypeptides their secondary structure. But it doesn't end there. Remember the R groups that define each amino acid? Well, some of them are hydrophobic. And since the protein is in the cell, which is mostly water, all of those hydrophobic groups try to hide from the water by huddling together. And that can bend up the chain some more. Other R groups are hydrophilic, which if nothing else means that they like to form hydrogen bonds with other hydrophilic R groups. So we get more bonding and more bending, and our single file line has now taken on a massively complex three-dimensional shape. It also explains why I can fix my bed head by wetting my hair with water. The water helps break some of those hydrogen bonds in the keratin, which relax is its structure. That way I can comb it out and when it dries those bonds reform and voila, perfect hair. All of this shape caused by bonding between R groups gives our polypeptide its tertiary structure. So now we have a massively contorted polypeptide chain and it actually contorts very precisely. Sometimes just one chain is what makes up the whole enzyme or protein. In other proteins, like hemoglobin, several different chains come together to form a quaternary structure. So quick review of structure. The sequence is the primary structure. The backbone of hydrogen bonds forming sheets and spirals are the secondary structure. Our group bonds are tertiary in the arrangement of multiple proteins together give the quaternary structure. These polypeptides are either structural proteins, like this thing at the bottom here, that you can find in your muscle or in my hot pocket. They might also be enzymes. Enzymes, like, do stuff. They can cut up biological molecules like I do with the chef's knife. They can mix stuff and they can put stuff together. So from that one recipe book, we get all the ingredients and all the tools necessary to make me, which is better than a hot pocket. Would you all agree? Now take your time with this stuff. Feel free to watch the episode a couple of times because next week, we're going to talk about how cells swap all of this genetic information through reproduction. Thank you for watching this episode by now. You should probably know how this works. You can click on any of the links over there and it'll take you back to that point in the show as long as you're not watching on your cell phone. It doesn't work on cell phones. I apologize for that. Thank you to everyone who helped us put this show together and thank you to you for watching it today. If you have any questions about this episode, please leave them in the comments below or you can get us on Facebook or Twitter. And that's all. Goodbye. And there we have the central dogma of biology. Thank you for watching.